So thank you for attending our program this evening, Support and Resources for Caregivers. Before we start this evening's program, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. On behalf of Vaughan Public Libraries, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that our libraries were built upon the territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation per the Toronto Purchase Agreement or Treaty 13. We also recognize we are situated on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee who occupied this land before the arrival of European settlers. The City of Vaughan is currently home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge their contributions to the life and prosperity of this land. Uh, and welcome to SHRID. So SHRID works with the Ontario Caregiver Organization as the project lead for strategic partnerships and innovation. He has over seven years experience in Canada in stakeholder and community engagement and in co-design work. He holds a master in public health degree and has worked in global and health initiatives in developing countries as well, all prior to him immigrating to Canada. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, I see someone's in the waiting room. I'm just going to admit them. <laughs> there you go. I'm on it. I'll, uh, be, I'll do the waiting room. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm coming to you from the Ontario Caregiver Organization. And today I'm going to go over um, what services are available for family caregivers across uh, the province, uh, who family caregivers are, um, where they are and what kind of supports that they are providing, uh, and also look at uh, what service gaps they might have identified uh, and how we're working to kind of uh, fill those gaps and needs. So I'm going to do a share of my screen and show my slide deck. Uh, while I'm showing my slide deck, I tend to turn my video off so that you guys can concentrate on the slide deck and also to avoid any technical uh, glitches or difficulties. So but towards the end, when uh, in the, the Q&A session starts, I'll be more than happy to come back on screen and answer any questions you may have. So like uh, Rachel mentioned, I am coming, from the, coming to you from the Ontario Caregiver Organization. So let's start by defining family caregivers. So at OCO, the Ontario Caregiver Organization, we define family caregivers as any family member, friends, or neighbors who are providing care for someone in an unpaid capacity. And it could be due to any of the reasons you see on the screen there. So uh, uh, it could be a mother taking care of a child with cancer. It could be a friend, uh, roommate who is taking care of another roommate because they've gotten into an accident. It could be a um, neighbor who is helping another neighbor with their groceries and making sure that they pick up their medications just because uh, the, the, the neighbor who needs support may not have immediate family members or friends uh, other than the, uh, the, the neighbor themselves. So if they're providing care in an unpaid capacity, uh, then we refer to them as family caregivers. From a number standpoint, there are about 4 million caregivers, family caregivers, including young caregivers uh, in Ontario and young caregivers defined between the age of 15 and 25 at OCO. Uh, but anyone, any caregiver under the age of 25 is a young caregiver. But at OCO, we work with those individuals 15 and above. Um, when we're looking at uh, age groups, we see that a primarily, a primarily uh, caregivers are between the age of 26 and 63. And they also identify as being part of that sandwich generation. Uh, that means they're sandwiched between uh, taking care of someone older to them while also having responsibilities towards younger individuals at home. And then um, caregivers are, when it comes to gender, almost evenly split where more than half of caregivers are and identify as female. And a large uh, percentage of caregivers, 64% of them say that they are employed currently, but we know that among those 64%, more than 69% of caregivers say that uh, it has become really difficult for them to balance work and caregiving responsibilities. So based on where you are in the province, so if you're in the central mississauga halton uh, region, most caregivers are between the age of 46 and 55 and are taking care of someone uh, who's older, so an older adult. Uh, if you're, I know you guys are coming from Vaughan, so you would probably be around um, uh, Toronto central region, 
where most caregivers are aged 26 to 45, and a majority of them are taking care of their parents, in-laws, and grandparents at home or in an institution-based setting as well. Um, and um, unanimously, we hear from caregivers all across the province. And what we do is we offer opportunities to, for caregivers to share their stories and because each story is different so that we understand what kind of gaps are there in terms of service based on where they're from. And we come to, uh, together with caregivers to identify common solutions so that we can help support them and bridge those gaps and service needs as well. So um, most caregivers um, say, uh, almost 50% of caregivers say that their top responsibility in terms of caregiving is to offer and provide emotional support to the care recipient. Um, other responsibilities that caregivers most commonly um, are involved in are around offering behavioral supports, especially if there is something like responsive behaviors due to dementia, for example. Uh, they offer physical support, such as lifting, moving, uh, getting in and out of wheelchairs. So all of those are physical supports. Um, a lot of them offer basic medical supports, such as administering medications. But during the pandemic, we're seeing that a lot of caregivers are taking on more complex or um, heavy caregiving responsibilities, such as you know, uh, giving injections, changing G-tubes, uh, changing catheters, changing wound packages, things that probably um, professionals were coming into their home, but now because of the pandemic and all the vulnerability associated with having external people come in and out of uh, the care recipient's life, um, the caregiver, family caregiver has had to take on those responsibilities. And then almost unanimously, all, all caregivers say that they're at some point in some way involved in personal care for the care recipient. So um, changing incontinence products or cleaning up after them or um, giving them a bath or you know, clipping toenails. So all of these different things, uh, caregivers are very regularly uh, involved in as well. So each year, what we do is we collect data, we collect information from family caregivers on, based on their experiences to identify, you know, what are their most um, prominent, what we call pain points. So we, you can go and read uh, uh, in further detail all of the things that were identified by caregivers in our spotlight report. And I've linked this, um, the report on, on the page at the bottom right there. I'll be happy to share the slide deck at, at the end as well. So if you want to take this, you can take it with you. Um, and you can find more information around what caregivers are saying are their more prominent pain points. But um, unanimously, uh, th uh, these three points that caregivers have really, really um, stressed over the last year is that uh, more than 63% of caregivers say that they have hit their breaking points. So they are at already or very close to burnout. Um, and then... 33% of caregivers face barriers in accessing support. And these could be language barriers. This could be access barriers, such as um, uh, um, uh, availability of wheel strands, for example, or availability of a ride share program because they can't get from one place to the next because um, of X, Y, Z reasons, or availability of um, respite options for the caregiver, right? So a range of different issues. And then we talked about how during the pandemic, there are a lot of caregivers who are taking on that heavier, more complex uh, uh, caregiving responsibilities. So almost 79%, that is a huge percentage of caregivers say that they feel that they've taken on responsibilities that probably a nurse or a PSW would be coming into uh, whatever setting the caregiver and the care recipient live in or are or, or engaged in and, and take on those activities. So, um, you know, that really affects uh, different aspects of a caregiver and a care recipient's life. Um, and we'll talk about that as, as well as we go through the presentation. So I'm gonna share a quick video and uh, we'll come back right after. So I became a caregiver in my early mid-teens um, when my sister experienced an accident and she broke her foot. But she was misdiagnosed for a number of years and through the repeated trauma, she developed uh, complex regional pain syndrome, which is a rare debilitating nerve disorder. 
because she had a rare disease, nobody knew about it and nobody knew what was going on. And it, and it took a lot of trial and error to figure out how to best support her in there. My role within my family was a lot of, uh, of emotional support. I offered a lot of like, navigating, so managing her pain, so through preparing her medications and almost crisis control every every day. We're lucky now to have found uh, almost a support group of people with like the same disease and same symptoms and finding your your network of social support is fundamental in your own well-being as well. Somebody who understands your experience that has been one of the most defining things in my journey as well as finding a purpose um, and spinning negative experiences that you may have as a caregiver and finding a way to create positives out of it. The, the Ontario Caregiver Organization has been a great help because it's given me a voice. I pushed for supports for young caregivers through the Ontario Caregiver Organization and through the Change Foundation and has given me a role in supporting the future generations and future caregivers and that has been a newfound kind of passion of mine and that is a positive that came out of caregiving that wouldn't have happened otherwise. When you have hope and when you have a sense of purpose and you have love, it's a whole lot easier to manage everything that's going around. Okay, so Michaela was actually really instrumental in helping us set up our Young Caregiver program. And why I wanted to show you this video was just to give you a sense of how we work with caregivers and um, based on their experiences and based on their experiences, you know, they kind of talk about their experiences and they identify their own needs. And based on those needs, we try and find solutions that work best for them. Uh, we, so she talked about, you know, finding a support group and uh, all, of the, all of the different options, right? So uh, we help facilitate those, those solutions. So if someone comes to us and says, you know, I really don't have, I've, uh, I've uh, tried to find uh, someone to talk to who's experienced something similar to I have, but I really haven't been able to connect with anyone. Can you help me? Can you, you know, direct me to a caregiver who may be experiencing something similar? So we work with the caregiver to generate those solutions as we go along as well. So, oh, sorry. So Michaela talks about how, um, you know, caregiving has impacted her life. We know that caregiving uh, impacts caregivers, every caregiver in a different way, because caregiving means so many different things. And based on a person's culture, based on a person's age, based on a person's previous experiences, right, it really shapes an, uh, an individual's caregiving journey. It takes, um, it impacts their time, uh, time that they could probably be spending on something else, uh, maybe towards themselves or spending with another person. Uh, it takes away from their employment and work-life balance uh, where they might be starting to underperform at work uh, and, you know, um, may not be, uh, you know, the best versions of themselves at their workplace. Uh, it definitely takes away from their finances. And we know this for a fact, especially during the pandemic with all of the extra uh, caregiving that 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 caregivers have had to um, you know uh, 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 take on during the pandemic, they've had to uh, increase their finances towards caregiving. So it has caused a burden on them. Uh, it takes away from their health and wellness, their mental, emotional, physical, and social well-being, because they're so focused on the person that they're caring for. A lot of the time, caregivers forget to take their, to take care of themselves. Now. Um, I, I am not one to talk about self-care very uh, candidly because self-care means different things for different people. And it's not fair. It's not as easy as me saying, you need to take care of yourself. You need to have self-care because self-care is a really hard thing to do because caregivers are so involved in, in so many different aspects of the care recipient's life, right? It's not easy. So, but we can, again, uh, like I said, work with caregivers to find solutions that work best for them. And then we talked about how uh, during the pandemic, we've seen those changes in, in, in um, work responsibilities and caregiving responsibilities where they've taken on heavier responsibilities. Because of that, in some cases, we've heard caregivers say, 
that their, their, their family dynamics have changed, their personal relationships with the person they're caring for has changed because now uh, the person they're caring for probably sees them more as a nurse or a professional rather than my daughter who's doing this for me because of all of the, all of the different um, uh, medical type of procedures that they might be involved in as well. So it really affects uh, caregiving in all these different aspects, caregivers in all these different aspects. So we are here again to address caregiver needs. Um, we know that over two thirds of caregivers have found it difficult to carry on with their caregiving responsibilities. So our, a huge part of what we do at OCO is try and help them navigate the healthcare system so that they can get the supports they need and the supports that are in place. Um, but we also know that about one in four caregivers say that they don't know what they need because they don't know where to start. Uh, maybe they've just recently been given the diagnosis and they really uh, are taken aback. Uh, they haven't had time to prepare. Uh, so they just don't know where to start or where, you know, what they need at that point, right? Um, maybe there are competing um, uh, priorities and you really don't know, the caregiver really doesn't know how, which, uh, which one to prioritize over the other. So that's where we kind of try and step in and say, okay, you know what, let's talk about it. Let's talk about all of your competing priorities and then see which one makes most sense for this week. And let's forget about the others and then go one step at a time. So, um, so I wanna to talk to you about who we are and what we do exactly. So our purpose, we uh, as the Ontario Caregiver Organization aim to be that one-stop shop for information and supports for caregivers across Ontario. So we were established in the spring of 2018 um, with the primary goal of supporting uh, caregivers in Ontario, family caregivers in Ontario. So um, we, um, uh, we work with caregivers regardless of their age, regardless of where they're coming from, from the province, right? And regardless of what their background may be. We don't even ask for diagnosis or anything. So as long as anyone identifies as a caregiver who's supporting another person in their life, uh, we help provide support for that for that person. So we're an independent nonprofit agency that's funded by the Ministry of Health. So all of our directives come from the Ministry of Health. So part of what we do is also we engage with caregivers and we provide feedback to the ministry around what caregivers are facing so that future programs and future grant opportunities and future funding um, you know, reflects those needs that are identified by caregivers across the province as well. So we improve aware, improved awareness and recognition of the contribution and importance of caregivers. So based on where you are in Canada, we know that caregivers contribute to anywhere from 26 to $72 billion in, in healthcare money. That is a lot of, lot of uh, you know, healthcare money and a lot of work that caregivers provide in an unpaid capacity, mind you. So without family caregivers, our healthcare system would essentially collapse, right? So we have to really, we work with caregivers and we work with the general public uh, to really inform the general public around who caregivers are, who family caregivers are, and what they're doing and what value they bring to our healthcare system. Uh, we connect caregivers to information and supports regardless of age, condition, or location. I talked about that. Uh, another part of what we do is we avoid duplication of services that already exist and develop partnerships. So that's another big part of my role is to look at where uh, caregiver supports are in place in the province and also regionally. And then if there are two organizations that are working towards a common goal to help caregivers, I, I, I really raise the question, are they really speaking to themselves? Are they aware of each other's services so that there is no duplication? And is it easy for the caregiver to access either of the services without having to go to two different organizations and do two different intake processes? Because you know, how many times is the caregiver gonna explain their situation? So we wanna have these conversations and we wanna identify these system partners that are working in similar grounds, either geographically or programmatically and see if they're you know, really talking with each other so that caregivers can seamlessly access supports from one program to the next or one organization to the next. And then as I've talked about throughout the presentation, we work with caregivers to identify gaps in service needs and there are opportunities for caregivers to provide feedback, which I'll talk about as we go through the presentation as well. So what is it that we do around um, you know, offering information to the public uh, uh, and caregivers themselves? 
So one of the things that we have at OCO is the I am a caregiver toolkit. So this is a toolkit that offers um, new and experienced caregivers information around what it means to be a caregiver. So it offers different um, tips on avoiding conflict, uh, relationship management, money management, and a range of different things uh, through, through the toolkit, right? And additionally, more importantly, it offers worksheets to help the caregiver kind of build a support team. So uh, the worksheet identifies activities that the caregiver might be involved in now or might be involved later in the future. And it offers an opportunity for caregivers to sit down with friends, family, um, neighbors, whoever it may be, and say, hey, you know what, you offered to help me. Uh, why don't we go through this toolkit and see, you know, where, which areas you might be able to help me so that caregivers can, uh, you know, kind of delegate some of those responsibilities and tr uh, try and avoid excessive stress and burnout in their situation as well. What it also offers the toolkit is it offers a self-assessment to caregivers to see how they may be coping with uh, their current caregiving responsibilities. So the self-assessment is ma made to be done uh, over time as caregiving responsibilities change. You're supposed to redo them as we go along. Uh, and the, the, the score that the caregiver gets really reflects their state of mind, their emotional state of mind. And then based on the score, if they get a higher score, that means that they're probably experiencing some level of stress and burnout. Uh, and if they're experiencing lower, if they get lower scores, then they may not be experiencing as many um, levels of uh, stress and burnout. So it really offers different um, resources to help manage those, uh, the, the, the stress and burnout that caregivers might be feeling as well. So I invite you to go and check out the toolkit and see if it makes sense for you as well. And then we talked about uh, how caregivers identified that they were finding it very challenging balancing work and caregiving. So we partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Association to create this work and caregiving um, uh, toolkit for working caregivers. So when I say working caregivers, I mean working family caregivers, not professional caregivers, right? So this toolkit uh, enables a family caregiver who may be working full time to go to their uh, manager, their boss, their CEO, whoever it may be, and have meaningful conversations around what it means to be a caregiver and how what they might identify as, as steps that the organization can take to make sure that the organization is caregiver friendly and that, that so that they can be more um, productive at work while also being uh, the best version of caregivers that they want to be especially during the pandemic where now work and caregiving have kind of just gelled into one activity where someone might be sitting at a desk, you know, working on a computer while sitting next to someone who may be laying down on a bed and taking care of that person at the same time. We know that it's very difficult for caregivers to kind of balance those two activities, right? So this tool, this toolkit really offers different tips on how to start the conversation with your work around what it means to be a caregiver and how to kind of create those um, uh, caregiver friendly workplaces as well. And then we have a range of different ways that we offer information to the public uh, through our website, through our monthly e-newsletter for caregivers. We have a quarterly e-bulletin for care providers uh, that talks about the different uh, organizations and how they're working with caregivers so that they can prove to be success stories for others to follow. Uh, and then we also offer information through social media platforms as well, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Our website is, has a myriad of information. And as you can imagine, one of the most common things we get asked is around what kind of financial supports are out there for family caregivers. So we have a web page dedicated to family caregivers around the types of financial supports that are available either through the federal government, the provincial government, or sometimes the municipal or even organizationally as well. So most recently we had a webinar from with CRA around what tax benefits family caregivers are entitled to. So we have a um, um, uh, tax credits for family caregivers section within this website that family caregivers can go and uh, look at and see if they may be eligible to apply for some tax credits as well. 
And then our website also offers a range of resources around um, a different tip sheets uh, on a range of different topics. Uh, we have a COVID-19 resource center. Uh, we have web pages dedicated to particular populations as well. So resources for indigenous caregivers, for LGBTQ caregivers. We have one for BIPOC caregivers as well. Um, and then we also have information around upcoming events uh, and also information on what partners might be doing out in the field as well. So our calendar not only holds information around what events OCO has to offer, but also if there's a partner that has a particular event or a webinar or something that might be interest to caregivers, we make sure that we put it onto our calendar as well. And then we also have a podcast. So we have a podcast that's available through Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any of the major podcast providers. And it's a space where we invite subject matter experts and caregivers to have discussions on topics that matter most to caregivers themselves. So the topics are identified by caregivers themselves. And the topics are things like uh, what it means to become a caregiver. How do you keep relationships strong? How do you manage money? Uh, one of the biggest things that we hear, one of the most common things we hear from uh, caregivers across the province is around around, especially after they become a caregiver, that they start to experience really disturbed sleep patterns. So how do you get a good night's sleep? How do you manage your sleep? And how do you make sure that you have enough energy the next day so that you can take care of the person you're taking care of, right? So um, we have two seasons uh, right now for the Time to Talk podcast, and uh, season three is going to be available soon as well. Um, next, again, feedback from caregivers saying that um, sometimes when they, were, when, when they requested uh, information, uh, they got information uh, that was either too lengthy or that had a lot of uh, medical jargon in them and they were not able to understand. So we created this 90 second caregiver letter uh, with, in, in, in really plain language so that caregivers can get information on different topics related to caregiving in their mailbox that they can read within 90 seconds. Um, once they read it, if they are interested in that particular topic, then there are other clickable, actionable items and other uh, uh, information that they can access through the letter itself. Uh, and each week uh, you get a letter in, the, in your in, in mailbox and it uh, deals a different topic. Like for example, one might be around a conflict management to, uh, uh, in caregiving. One might be around um, uh, uh, family dynamics. One might be around uh, medication management. So a range of different topics every week uh, that you get in your mailbox that you can read in 90 seconds or less. And then with that aim of being that one-stop shop for information and services, we established the Ontario Caregiver Helpline. So the helpline is a 24 seven resource that's available for caregivers to call and access information and supports for themselves or for the person that they're caring for. So it could be, hey, I'm looking for meals on wheels, or it could be, hey, I'm really stressed out. I need to get some sort of respite care or I need more information around how I can manage my stress and burnout, or I need to talk with someone uh, based on what I'm experiencing. I really need to talk with someone who maybe have gone, has gone through it. Like, can you help me find someone? So it could be a range of different things. So the, the helpline is available 24 seven uh, by phone, or uh, if someone doesn't want to call, there's a live chat option that's available on the weekdays, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And the helpline also offers interpretation services in 150 different languages as well. And this is available throughout the province of Ontario. It's in partnership with 211, where we've trained some staff at 211 to be community resource specialists and kind of respond to uh, caregiver-based inquiries. We also offer a range of different webinars on, on, on these uh, six thematic areas you see on the screen. Um, we offer webinars about twice a month, uh, both in English and French, uh, and um, uh, it could be on, on any of these thematic areas. So most recently, um, I think we had, uh, we had one around tr uh, transitioning from a hospital to long-term care and back uh, vice versa. So the, the things, topics that caregivers identify as, oh, I need more information on this area. If there's enough interest, we seek out the subject matter expert 
and make sure that we have those webinars as well. So if you go to the webinars for caregivers right on top there and you click on that link, then it'll take you to that web page. Uh, and uh, and then you can access all of these different webinars. So I'd say about 99% of our webinars are recorded, uh, unless there's specific webinars that aren't, we aren't allowed to record. Um, like for example, the government of Canada doesn't allow us to record webinars, um, but I'd say 99% of webinars are recorded and are available through our webinars page as well. We also have on a clinical front, a program called SCALE, which stands for uh, Support for Caregiver Awareness, Learning and Empowerment. Um, we run this uh, twice a year and um, uh, our most recent cycle, which started on February 7th, is almost done. I think tomorrow is the last week four of session four, time for self-care while caregiving. Um, so this is a, eight week program, but caregivers have the option of signing up for either um, one or all eight session based on their interest. And once they do sign up and watch uh, the live recording, live webinar, um, then they have the uh, avail, uh, uh, option to uh, sign up for either uh, uh, individual or group counseling sessions. Um, uh, the, the, there is a screening process that uh, um, uh, you know, uh, that the facilitators take on to make sure that the, the, the caregiver fits into either the individual group counseling. And this program is run by uh, registered nurses and registered social workers as well. However, if you want to, go, if, you've, uh, if you've missed the cycle and you want to go and check out um, uh, at the topics, any of the previous topics, they're all recorded. The most recent version is recorded and is uploaded onto our SCALE webpage. Uh, and you can go and check out all eight weeks as well, if you'd like. But in the recorded versions, unfortunately, you don't have access to the counseling sessions. And then um, in the video, we, Michaela talked about how she helped uh, develop and plan our Young Caregiver program. So we established young, the youngcaregiverconnect.ca website, which is for young caregivers between the age of 15 and 25. Uh, it's a safe space for young caregivers to come together and have discussions on topics that make more sense to them, that, that they find meaningful. Um, a lot of young caregivers, when they uh, identify as a young caregiver, um, they, they talk about one of the biggest things that, that they experience is the loss of uh, social circles. So uh, the, the website is a safe space for them to come together and engage with other young caregivers and kind of help build that social circle and support circle for themselves as well. Um, the content and all of the forums as part of this website uh, are all driven by young caregivers themselves. We as OCO staff are only on the back end of things and we're not privy to all of the conversations that are happening. They're supposed to be anonymous and safe for them, uh, for, for the young caregivers participating. We also offer e-learning opportunities for caregivers. Um, we have an online platform where caregivers can go and take any of these courses. I should mention all of our services, everything is free of cost. You don't have any charge for any of the programs. Uh, so feel free to access all of them. Uh, the Caregiver 101 course is a really great uh, start off course for especially for young and newer caregivers to kind of really understand what caregiving means and what that experience might look like. Uh, the Caregivers Partnering with Health Professionals is a course that talks about how you can engage better with healthcare professionals and make sure that your voice is heard at a healthcare professional setting. Um, and then also that you are part of the decision-making process when it comes to the care recipient, because uh, let's face it, without the caregiver, none of the medical or social prescriptions that are given by the healthcare professionals are ever going to be filled. Uh, it's really important to incorporate the caregiver voice and make sure that they're included in that decision-making process. And then the Roadmap to Caregiving is a, um, a course around, um, you know, uh, caregiving for someone with a mental illness or an addiction challenge. We also offer um, peer support groups for, uh, for individuals to participate in either they can register or they can walk in. Um, you can uh, go onto the register here page and see what's available. And then based on that, you can just decide which one you want to participate in. Uh, the peer support groups offer uh, emotional and social support. Um, however, because we work with all caregivers, 
uh, we are non-disease specific. So uh, the supports here in place are not disease specific supports. If someone is looking for that kind of support, then the peer facilitator of these groups will help guide you towards more specific supports as well. So uh, uh, another part of these support groups is the some navigation help for the caregiver themselves. And then there is a specific uh, uh, support group for young caregivers, which happens every Wednesday from 7 to 9 p.m. On a more personal level, we offer one-to-one -one peer supports for caregiver participants who are really struggling and want to connect with another caregiver who may be more experienced and have maybe gone through similar situations. So we match a peer, peer mentor who is an experienced caregiver themselves, who has received peer mentorship training from OCO with a caregiver participant who is looking for that additional one-to-one -one emotional and peer support. Um, on the face of it, this program is billed as a telephone-based program where uh, the caregiver and the peer mentor talk over the phone once a week. But as they build a relationship and as they build a rapport, we really leave it to the two of them to define the terms of the relationship. So if they want to meet on a virtual platform like this, that's great. Um, if they happen to be in the same city and based on local public health guidelines, want to meet at a local coffee shop, that's fine as well. Uh, we really leave it to them to kind of define those terms. But uh, for the most part, uh, caregivers and peer mentors talk over the phone and kind of uh, strategize and plan for the future and see how the peer mentor can help support the caregiver who may be going through some emotional distress. Uh, you can sign up to be either a peer mentor or a caregiver participant through that link on the bottom of the page right there. And then additionally, we also work with system uh, partners across the board. So we work with um, the Ontario health teams all the way down to grassroots organizations and faith-based centers, libraries, all across the province. So we offer uh, learning and education opportunities to them um, around uh, what it means to engage better with caregivers. A lot of the time we hear from system partners saying that they're very client or patient centric, patient focused. So we talk to them about how they can involve caregivers and how they can um, uh, embed caregiver supports as part of their support services as well. Uh, and then we offer tools and resources on how they can make that happen. So we have a range of different tools and toolkits available for them to kind of, um, you know, incorporate caregivers within uh, uh, their workplace as well. And then we collaborate with uh, system partners across the board to offer different uh, learning opportunities like today, uh, as well as, as, as um, uh, you know, partner with them to create more uh, solutions for family caregivers across the province. And then if there are organizations that are looking to kind of build and scale their uh, caregiver support programs, we help guide them through that process as well. So we work with service providers on three big pillars, mainly around including caregivers as partners on the care team, where we, uh, we offer different tools on how they can um, 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 incorporate caregiver voices and make sure that caregivers are included in the decision-making process when it comes to uh, care delivery for the care recipient. And then we connect caregivers to supports for their well-being through system partners. So all of our programs and also maybe partner programs, we help with the system navigation piece as well. And then we engage caregivers as experts to inform care design and delivery. What that means is we offer opportunities for caregivers to participate in policy level um, decision-making processes in different settings, whether it's through OCO or maybe a hospital setting or a long-term care setting to see if um, uh, that organization is caregiver friendly or not and what steps those organizations can take to make sure that caregivers are included in their um, mode of delivery as well. So we, we work with, with service providers in all these different ways. Uh, we have a care provider resource center, which offers all of the different tools around meaningful engagement and co-design. Um, I encourage if you're a care provider to go and check these out. Um, we offer e-learning opportunities for care providers as well, 
Uh, so I talked about the partnering with care professionals to um, uh, e-learning for caregivers. So on the flip side, this is for care providers on how to um, take steps in your own practice to make sure that you include caregivers as part of the essential care team as well. Um, we have toolkits for care, uh, care providers as well on how to better engage, how to recognize and support caregivers. Uh, a lot of the time we hear from caregiver, uh, uh, sorry, system partners saying, okay, we're ready to, um, you know, start providing supports to uh, care, caregivers, but how do we know who's a caregiver? And even if we do know who's a caregiver, how do we support them in our workplace? So we offer different ways that caregiver, that, that system partners uh, and uh, organizations can help support caregivers. We don't want them to be experts around caregiver supports, but at least at the minimum, be able to refer them to the appropriate services uh, as, again, as appropriate as well. And then we offer a range of different privacy and consent resources for caregivers and care providers alike. We know that caregivers and care providers talk about how complex it is to understand some of these privacy and consent resources when it comes to rights and responsibilities of caregivers and rights and responsibilities of care providers. So we've taken that legislature and we've kind of created these eight resources in really plain language so that everybody can understand what those rights and responsibilities are from each vantage point. So where it says suite of eight resources on the slide, if you click on that, then you'll be taken to a page where you can go and access these different resources and you can understand, um, you know, uh, Ontario's health privacy laws as well. Again, I'm happy to share the slide deck so that you can have this with you and click on all of these resources. And then early on in the presentation, I talked about uh, how we have toolkits for um, family caregivers who are working to kind of engage better with their employers and talk to employers around building caregiver friendly workplaces. On the flip side, we have tools, toolkits for senior management leadership and HR on how to proactively look at policy level work and take steps in their organization to make sure that caregivers are well supported in their workplace. So we are working with multiple organizations, both in the nonprofit as well as the for-profit sector uh, to kind of um, uh, let them take a look at their own organization and take steps to create those caregiver friendly workplaces as well. So I know we're working with TD Bank, with RBC, we're working with um, Canada Credit Union, we're working with a range of different organizations as well. And then I talked about how we are continuously learning from caregivers as we go and we have multiple opportunities for caregivers to voice their opinions and give feedback around what they may be experiencing. Uh, so the spotlight report is a great example of that. So you can go check that out as well. But most recently, what we did was we launched a platform called Caregiver Voices, which is an opportunity for caregivers to sign up to be notified on the range of different opportunities that might be uh, available throughout the province. So whether it's uh, someone's developing a resource and we want caregivers to provide feedback on that resource, or if there's a research opportunity from a certain university around caregiving needs, or uh, if there is a government call out around uh, looking at service standards in long-term care and seeing what happened during the pandemic and you know what kind of feedback caregivers can provide around that. So a range of different things that are available through the Caregiver Voices platform. Uh, it's a zero commitment for caregivers. All they do is they go onto the Caregiver Voices platform, sign up and, and, and click on OK notifications, and then they'll be notified on the different opportunities that might arise throughout, uh, arise throughout the province. And then based on their interests, if one of them particularly speaks to them, they can click on that and say, okay, I want to participate. So in no way is the caregiver committing to any of the, all, all of the different opportunities if they just create a, 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 a username and uh, login for this platform. Uh, so yeah, so this is one of the ways that we, we continually look to learn from caregivers throughout the province. Uh, and if you are so inclined, you please feel free to go and create a uh, username and password and, and see what's, what opportunities are out there. And then um, lastly, we also offer um, uh, a lot of different 
Um, we work with a lot of different um, news organizations and media to kind of talk about uh, caregiver pain points and make sure that caregiver issues are in the forefront of uh, public opinion so that the public can speak to uh, the importance of supporting caregivers so that when it comes to, um, for example, election time, uh, you, you, you uh, reach out to your uh, MP, MPP to make sure that they are supporting caregivers uh, uh, in, in, in their stance as well so that we can continue this work that we're doing. Remember, we are 100% funded by the Ministry of Health. And so we really rely on uh, the ministry to make sure that caregivers and caregiver issues are our top, uh, top priority across the province. So um, I realized that I have not changed my title on here. <laughs> uh, so anyways, my contact email stays the same. I know I spoke to a lot of different programs and a lot of different resources. Uh, again, I'll be happy to share the slide deck. You have my email right there. If you don't have any questions today, that's fine but uh, you can always email me at a later date if something does come up uh, or if you have any questions. Again, I'm here for, uh, um, uh, for those questions and to see if I can answer them. Okay, I'm gonna stop share and hand it back to Rachel and turn my video on to see if there are any questions. Thank you so much for such an informative session. I think everyone can agree. There's a lot of information there. Um, it's going to be really useful. I think a lot of people, several people in the chat would appreciate the slide deck as well due to some um, technical difficulties and not being able to see the screen. I don't think, I think there's only one person that ha was having that issue, but um, I think they would love to see the slide deck at some point. Um, so there's one comment in the chat that said, my experience is friends and family who do not or have never done any caregiving offer great advice and make you feel like you're not doing enough. Neither do they offer you a day off or assist in any way, even pick up groceries or meds. Yeah, um, that's not uncommon at all. We hear that from caregivers all the time. Um, it's a really hard one. Um, you know, I think a lot of the time, um, and it's a case by case basis. A lot of the time people don't understand what it means to be a caregiver and, oh, oh you're just taking care of someone, but they feel that there's this whole army of people there to take care of that individual when it's actually only you and they don't really understand that one-to-one -one dynamic, right? So that's one part of what we're trying to do is talk to everybody anywhere in Ontario to tell them, you know, caregivers have it tough, caregivers have it hard, this is what they're experiencing. And, you know, the more we hear from caregivers themselves, then we're able to, um, you know, spread that information around what caregivers are experiencing. We hope that it changes one mind at a time to help bring, you know, to see how they can help uh, a caregiver in their life that they, they might know. One way that we are doing that, for example, next week is National Caregiver Day. Um, uh, on Tuesday, April 4th is National Caregiver Day and we have a live event that we'll be hosting through our uh, webpage and I'm happy to share that link as well. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we are inviting caregivers to come and talk about their caregiving responsibilities and share what their experiences have been, especially during the pandemic around caregiving and what kind of supports that they think would be really beneficial, not only from a government or an organizational standpoint, but you know, just the next door neighbor or, uh, you know, the sister who lives maybe in a different province, like what kind of help that they can provide? Because sometimes, again, if the sister lives in a different province and you're here as the primary caregiver taking care of someone else, the sister might not have a full idea of what everything that you might be doing for the person that you're taking care of, right? So how do you convey that message? So that's a big one. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm um, sorry that you've had that experience, but, you know, we hope to learn from these experiences and we hope to share these stories so that, you know, in the future, uh, caregivers don't have to experience this. Thank you so much. There's another comment. I wasn't sure if the person who asked wanted to be more specific. Um, do you help caregivers get support for relief? 
Yeah, so if you call our helpline, definitely. So what we do is that we don't have any physical services in OCO, but we help connect the dots, right? So our helpline is exactly that. So what our helpline does is really um, uh, focus in on those organizations that have direct caregiver supports in place, right? So if you're looking for relief or respite options, short-term respite options, long-term respite options, uh, looking for help filling out a long-term care application, whatever it may be, call the helpline and the helpline will find you that service. Um, for the most part, the services that we offer through the helpline are also free of cost. Uh, we prioritize free services. Uh, in the event that a free of cost service is not available, then uh, the, the helpline will say, okay, here are your options for paid services as well. Thank you. Uh, another comment in the chat just came in. This whole caregiving thing is very overwhelming. Does OCO help the caregiver understand what resources are available? What type of help is available to help the person needing care, et cetera? And then Sana, I think you might have just answered the question. But yeah. Absolutely. Again, I would again refer to the helpline. Our helpline is fantastic. Our community resource specialists have been trained in this regard itself. Uh, they, they, have, they go through specialized training on how to help uh, uh, look for assistance in terms of caregiving and what caregivers specifically need. So that's a great way to go. If, if um, you know, you, you, some, some people are there ready to call the helpline, some people are not. If you want to go, check out our website. Our website has a wealth of information. Uh, I, I, a great place to start is the, is the webinars. The webinars have a wealth of information. There are so many, there are like more than 40 webinars that are recorded. If you go onto our webinars page and just go and see what's out there. And um, we have webinars talking about, um, you know, um, uh, a range of topics around self-care, around managing money, managing sleep, and a range of different things. If you don't have time even going into turning on the computer and watching something, just download the podcast. The pod, and just close your eyes for a minute and listen to the podcast. The podcast is another great way to start. Uh, it gives you a lot of information. Again, the podcast involves caregivers themselves who are talking about their experience and their needs. And when then they invite a subject matter expert to kind of help them break them down and find solutions. So the podcast is a great way to start. And for some people, that's enough. For some people, it's okay, talk to the helpline and see what the helpline can offer. And the helpline not only offers services that OCO might have, but the helpline also um, offers services in and around the postal code that you're calling from. So a large part of, we have a regional team. And what they do is if they find a service, uh, say you guys are in Vaughn, so if they find a service in Vaughn, which is um, um, uh, directed to caregivers, oh, we must make sure that this is on our helpline so that if the caregiver calls and uh, we might be able to offer supports in one area, but then the help, for the most part, a lot of caregivers want to connect with on the ground supports as well. Then we say, hey, why don't you connect with this service in Vaughn that might be able to offer more direct care. So we not only support, uh, provide in-house, but also whatever our partners have to offer, we make sure that those, those, those connection points are made as well. Um, is the helpline only available via telephone? Sometimes it's difficult to find the time to, during the day to call. Email would be great. So, yeah, it's a 24-7 service uh, um, over the phone, or there's a live chat option that folks can go online, but that's only, unfortunately, during the weekdays from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. only. So there's no email option at this time, unfortunately, but that's a good... Uh, feedback. I will take that back. That's a good, that's a good idea. I will take that back. Awesome. Thank you. Another question, a question, is there a place where caregivers can connect in person to share and discuss in lieu of Zoom? I know I would welcome having a coffee and sharing with others. Oh yeah, there, there are tons of places. Like we may not offer them again, but I know there are certain partners that offer them. For example, um, and, that, and this may not be you, but I know the Alzheimer's Society of Durham region, which is you guys, uh, offers what they call memory cafes, where caregivers of people living with dementia come together and they have coffee and talk. That's it. And that's a support circle. 
right? So those are memory cafes that happen in Vaughan uh, and a lot of uh, Durham region. I know that, there, no, York region, my, my mistake, York region. So you guys are York region. So that's where that they, they do have them as well. There's another agency, uh, and this does not have to be uh, dimension specific. Uh, they are a for-profit, but I'm, I'm thinking that this particular service is free. I don't know if you've heard of Mosaic Home Care. Uh, they, they run out of York region as well, Markham area mostly. Um, but yeah, they have a great support system in place. They have a walking clubs, they have uh, memory cafes, they have a range of different things that where you know, people come together and just have community. How do you differ from home and community care support services? Any thoughts? Yeah, um, so home and community care uh, support services are really case management supports where they have a care coordinator who is assigned to you and who comes and takes looks at, uh, looks at um, the um, care recipient, not so much the caregiver, although now they are doing a lot, they're doing really well in terms of trying to support the caregiver, yes. And that's part of what we have been doing is working with home and community care support services to make sure that when they go in to check for the care recipient, that they make sure that they check the caregiver as well. So that's what our role is to make sure that that happens, right? So we are the overarching agency that's trying to embed caregiver programming in all the different programs that home and community care support services has. I hope that kind of sort of answered your question. Are there any other questions from the group? On behalf of Vaughn Public Library Street, I wanna thank you so much for coming in and delivering this really meaningful talk to um, I think a really engaged audience. Um, can we contact Shred, Shred directly? Um, you provided uh, your email address, right? Uh, absolutely, I'll put it in the chat again. Okay. So that if, if you wanna do it right now, you can, there you go. Shred D at Ontario caregiver.ca. So just email me if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, please. And I, I encourage you if you have not, um, go and sign up for uh, the e-newsletter. The e-newsletter e for caregivers is really great. Again, I'm putting that in the chat box, ontariocaregiver.ca, subscribe. Um, the e-newsletter really gives you a wealth of information around the different types of supports that are in place. So yeah, I already did amazing, Tina. You are on top of things. That's awesome. Great, and then listen to the podcast if you're if you're able to. Again, just download it, put it on, close the eyes, and listen to it. It's really great, and we are, we have season three that is going to be launched pretty soon. So, uh, uh, so it's really interesting podcast. Thank you so much, um, everyone. I'll email you the slide deck if Shred is still willing to share that slide deck with me. I will. Um, Awesome, thank you. Um, I will. I'll send and you I'll, my email address. Uh, yes, please do. And I will also share another flyer for the National Caregiver Day event, which is happening on Tuesday, April 4th from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's a 45 minute event. Uh, so if you want to participate in that, uh, I mean, just not even participate. If you just want to click and just listen like today, that's fine. Right. Um, we'll just have caregivers talk and you'll, you'll hear from caregivers and you'll also hear from my CEO. And then we have another organization called Family Council of Ontario that does a lot of work with family caregivers in specifically in long term care settings. So we'll hear from her as well and caregiver who is kind of engaged in the long term care sector. So, yeah. So please, please join if you can. Amazing. Thank you awesome. so much again. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, until next time, take care. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.